Uh, so we're going to have uh, three presentations plus a video from our, uh, our team in the United States, La Rouge Pack, totaling about three hours. Then we're going to have Q&A for about an hour or so. I'm going to start with the Avni Tapper. All right, so bonjour, hello everyone. Uh, my presentation is gonna go through the, a bit of the current British geopolitical uh, paradigm that we are in right now. And, uh, and uh, what I'm gonna end at is uh, that if you wanna get out of that, there has to be a shift in a paradigm. Like there has to be a shift in, not in terms of an opinion of a few people, but uh, a a shift in terms of principle, a shift in terms of the way people can think and uh, their, their idea of humanity. That, has to, that is the most important shift. So I want to I wanna first get into a video because I was going to present this by myself, but since LPAC TV did such a good job yesterday on their website, I, I felt it best to, to let them uh, do the job. So I'm just going to, uh, we're going to just watch a 30 minute quick video which goes into Benghazi and then pursue the presentation. That, that is why, right now, it is so important for civilization to remove Obama. Because it's very important to understand that, you know, why, like, just to look at Al-Qaeda, like, this was created by the British, by the United States at that point as an operation, as one of its many kinds of operations to undermine nation states, to undermine the Middle East, the, the whole Asia and Africa region especially. But it now needs it no longer, really, because it owns the president of the uh, of, uh, of United States. It owns Barack Obama with its immense uh, financial institutions and its immense military, uh, military institutions with drones, with thermonuclear warfare, Al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden was pretty much obsolete and could be, could be undermined. And, and, and now what's common between, between these extremist networks and, and, and the, its creators is, is the ideology, is the ideology to rule the world through fear and chaos. And that's what we have to understand that the only way to break it is by, break, is, is by fighting for sovereignty of nations, is by fighting for sovereignty of mankind. And, and I'm gonna go through, for people who, I'm gonna go through a bit of a background that yes, this, it is in fact really the British and the United States behind not just funding, not just you know, giving them money, but actually aligning them strategically. And as we can see, I mean, for people who've, for people who have been around or uh, who've been on the website for at least two years, were very much aware when, when the United States military started deploying thermonuclear arsenal and uh, anti-ballistic missile shields in, in Eastern Europe, you had, you had, you had uh, Russia and China and our movement in the United States pretty much declared that something, something big is going on. That before any, anything in Syria or Libya happened, you already had the groundwork was being prepared for a general war. You already had various Al-Qaeda executives released from Guantanamo, released from prisons in Libya, shipped around, arranged and coordinated with each other before any, any of the media propaganda happened. And that is why it is, it's, it's very important right now to understand that this could have been forecasted. This was, this was known. For example, in 1999, the French Parliament put out a report, a very extensive 180-page report, called The City of London, Gibraltar, and the Crown Dependencies, Offshore Centers and Havens for Dirty Money, along with another report as an appendix, a 70-page report, which was the economic environment of Osama bin Laden, which was a, a very clear, a, a very important indictment dossier of indicting the British on their, on their role in, in creating these extremist networks in London. And then you had, you had also uh, this, uh, a very prominent French member of parliament who said that Tony Blair and his government preaches around the world against terrorism, 
he would be well advised to preach to his own bankers and oblige them to go after dirty money. Even the Swiss cooperate more than the English. And then you had, since then, you had, you had the 9-11 attacks. You had, you had a subsequent total cover-up of that. You had pretty much the Bush and Cheney administration doing everything possible to, to protect the Saudi and the British families. And, uh, but despite that, you had the Senate, the United States Senate put out a commission, a 9-11 commission report, fully detailing the British and Saudi alliance in, in organizing this. But the, 20, the, the very 28 pages of the report, which indicted the Saudis, was removed. Now, there were the, one of the people on, those, on that Senate panel was Senator Bob Graham, a Democrat from Florida. He wrote a book. He, he, he basically launched a crusade against, against Bush and to this day even against Obama for not declassifying those 28 pages, which, which, uh, which protect, by, by not declassifying them, you're protecting the Saudi families. And one of his important documents that he put out is this book, Intelligence Matters, the CIA, the FBI, Saudi Arabia, and the failure of America's war on terror. And, and, and since then, you had, you had, then you ha since then you've had Barack Obama continuing the cover-up, lying to the American families uh, by saying that he would declassify those 28 pages. In fact, that was one of his bases of his campaigns in 2008, would be that I would be the one to declassify the pages and indict the Saudi family. But that's not, that's the, the quite opposite is, is the reality. So what you're having is, is immense, that there are immense documents, like this is a proven fact, like you don't have to go through, you don't have to start investigations and you know there are documents, especially as another Senate report which talks about which, which basically indicts HSBC on drug money laundering, on the fact that it, there, these big banks, these Wall Street banks, the, they, need, they need narco terrorists, they need Al-Qaeda more than Al-Qaeda needs them. That, and it's the reverse. And this is something which the Canadian government, which the United States government, which the British government have denied, have, have, have said, well, no, that's not true. But this is something that the Russian government has, especially the Russians, have made it very clear. For example, you've got this guy, Viktor Ivanov, on the bottom left, who, who is uh, Russia's drug czar, anti-drug uh, czar, you can pretty much say. I forget his full title. But he, he basically is on a crusade, international crusade, to stop, to stop drug, uh, to, to basically stop the drug mafia. And he came out at multiple occasions calling for Glass-Steagall in the United States, saying that if the United States passes Glass-Steagall, you basically would put a huge, it would be a huge problem for, for funneling drug money around the world. And he was in, actually in Harvard, uh, in Harvard three days ago, working with, uh, giving a presentation, a conference with his American counterpart for three days on this very issue. And this is very important. So, So this is nothing new, this idea of, of laundering drug money of not just for the sake of profit. Again, this is an ideology. This is not profit. Like people have to understand that imperialism existed before oil, before drugs. This is an ideology. Like we don't go into Iraq and Iran just for oil. Now that's, that's not it. It's an ideology. It's depopulation. It's fear. It's, it's, it's for extremists. It's Wahhabism or whatever, but it's an ideology of ruling the world through fear and chaos. And this particular right now of the opium fields in Afghanistan and big money, big money funding and protecting that, this goes back to the British Empire. For example, the, the biggest bank, like the biggest, one of the biggest banks laundering drug money, which is HSBC, which was indicted by the Senate report recently was, was fined, was, was, was not jailed, because it's apparently too big to fail and too big to jail. But it was, it was fined about $1.2 billion. That's like, if you, if you want to understand the amount of money it has and amount, the amount that it had to 
pay for fine. It's like somebody who has $3,000 is paying $1 as fine. That's it. So you're having, you're having complete. Now this, this goes, the, the HSBC, the reason I brought it up, because HSBC is Hong Kong Shanghai Banking Corporations, and many people don't know that, which we meet in the street every day, and people don't know that. And, uh, but this is very important because it's, this is historically the bank that the British used and created for the opium drug wars. Because the opium was banned in Britain, like in their own nation, they would not let their population use opium. But it was forced through free trade and military conquest in Asia. Where you had in India, at the lower bottom, uh, bottom left, you had the Indians were forced to grow cash crops, opium, uh, cotton, and other, other non-grain products, which would be shipped out to other parts of the world, especially China, where the population was dumbed down, where the culture was destroyed, where the population was turned into a slave, and their sovereignty was undermined. Because you have a huge chunk of population living for, living for minute to minute pleasure. And so today, we don't really need that. The British doesn't really need that because they, they own the president of the United States. They, they own Adolf Hitler with a drone. That's pretty much what we have right now in the White House. And, and the most important and clear connection for anybody who says, well, that's, that's, that's a bit too much. Well, the, best, the easiest way and the best way to, to understand the British connection to Obama is Tony Blair who was Obama's campaign advisor, who has been in the United States for six months, pronouncing openly that he is in the United States to ensure Obama's victory, and is to this day a very top advisor to Obama, and who apparently is looking to re-enter British politics, so we better stop this war because that would, that would be quite insane. So what is it that these people are really after? So I mean, what is it that the principle that they, that, that, that they are so passionate to destroy and launch, launch crusades for like centuries? Because again, the empire has an idea of immortality. It, has an, it plans for the next century. And right now, the only way to understand what, what the empire fears and what undermines it is the, prince, the idea of Westphalia. How many of people here do not know what Westphalia is? Principle of Westphalia, okay. 1640, yeah. Well, Westphalia was a treaty, which was, which was not just a piece of document. This occurred after about, this occurred in 1648, after about 30 years of continuous religious local warfare in, in, in Europe. In some parts of Europe, the consequences were that about 50% of the parishes were destroyed. The population was overall was reduced to one third, in many cases down to 50, 40%. And you had the population leadership realize that this, is, this has got to end, that despite their personal differences, this, this is not, this is a, forget about development, this is an issue of survival. And we won't be able to survive right now. So you had, you had a treaty by a few leaderships in those regions to come together and realize that what's really playing them and what the real enemy is, is an empire, is an ideology of continuous warfare and, and, tre and treating mankind like cattle. So you had a treaty signed, which is the Treaty of Westphalia, which was not that you know, we, we, we hereby promise not to, not to fight each other, but was a treaty based on mutual cooperation, on mutual development. And for that, for that let's, let's read just the first two articles of the treaty to get people a better sense of what were they thinking about. Um, Jean-Philippe, you want to read Article 1? Article 1? Yeah. Article 1 begins, a Christian general and permanent peace and true and honest friendship must rule between the Holy Imperial Majesty and the Holy All Christian Majesty, as well as between all and every ally and follower of the mentioned Imperial Majesty, the House of Austria, etc., and successors, and 
this peace must be so honest and seriously guarded and nourished that each part furthers the advantage, honor, and benefit of the other. A faithful neighborliness should be renewed and flourished for peace and friendship and flourish again. Peace among sovereign nations requires, in other words, according to this principle, that each nation develops itself fully and regards it as itself as its self-interest to develop the others fully and vice versa. A real family of nations. Right. That the idea that your self-interest lies in developing others. That's the idea of peace. Is that the idea of the the idea is that you are you are you you are a part of something bigger than yourself, and that is why you cannot fall into momentary momentary uh, insanities. That you are your the the only way to ensure your survival and your happiness is in the happiness of others, which is a very Christian idea, which is a principle which nations adopted at that time. Now this was pretty important because this was upheld for about 400 years. This is the basis of sovereignty of nations. And this was the basis for, for, for all nations. This is the basis for all nations today. But this was broken pretty much blatantly under Obama. Like for 400 years, you have had this treaty, you've had this principle that people have a right to develop themselves and their neighbors. And, and, and you have you have nations, you have language, culture, territories which, which are sovereign, which have, which have a certain intrinsic idea to them. But they cannot develop that idea without developing the whole, without developing the whole of humanity. But under Obama, you had, you had the Libya case especially was a total undermining of the Constitution, a total, total, nah, I don't give a shit. I don't give a shit to the Constitution. I don't care what Westphalia says. Then this is this is exactly what is on his mind, which we will see. Okay, I'm going to skip a few slides, but not, none of the ideas. I'm going to come back to that one. So the Westphalia is exactly a very important principle which Tony Blair is fighting against, like he says in here in 2004. So for me, before September 11th. I was already reaching for a very different philosophy in international relations from a traditional one that has held sway since the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648. Namely, that a country's internal affairs are for it and you don't interfere unless it threatens you or breaches a treaty or triggers an obligation of alliance. I did not consider Iraq fitted into this philosophy, though I could see the horrible injustice done to its people by Saddam. So you have here a very skewed idea of Westphalia because for Tony Blair, the Westphalia is that you know we all mind our own business and you don't you don't look into my house and I don't look into what what you're doing, which was not what what Westphalia was, because Tony Blair and the British, frankly, had done nothing to develop Iraq before then. So this idea that oh well Saddam's a big problem, well you. You had never offered to develop it. You had never offered to, to, to uphold the Treaty of Westphalia, so you cannot say that it is not working and that it is obsolete. Your empire is the one that always undermined it and always made sure that no development happened in Africa and Asia. So the idea of Westphalia is obsolete, it, it, that is not true. This is, this is a universal principle. This is, this is not something that was created as an as a easy, easy way to live by in 1648. This is a universal principle of humanity. So this is what we're up against. And this is something that, that people, that, that, is, that is a very important test, like a litmus test for oligarchs and for, for people who are, who are British subjects, especially people like George Soros, who wrote in his book, The People's Sovereignty in 2004, that sovereignty is an anachronistic concept originating in bygone times when society consisted of rulers and subjects, not citizens. It became the cornerstone of international relations with the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648. The rulers of a sovereign state have a responsibility to protect the state's citizens. When they fail to do so, the responsibility is transferred to the international community. So that's pretty insane. So 
what we're going to get at is right now, right now, Tony Blair pretty much stormed, pretty much scared a lot of British people and, and international community with his coming, come, way before 9-11, pretty much laying the groundwork and changing the international relations from Westphalia to imperialism. And in many cases, declaring that openly. Like this was not something that was hidden. For example, you had Tony Blair's top advisor, Robert Cooper, wrote an extensive book called The Breaking of Nations, Order and Chaos in the 21st Century. And it's a pretty good read for people who want to understand just how screwed up these people are. And, uh, but to give people an idea, you know, you had, you had uh, Robert Cooper wrote another paper along with Tony Blair called The New Liberal Imperialism, which basically says, says that, we, that we must go towards a postmodern state, that nations must be destroyed, double standards must exist, that is a different kind of standard for Africa and a different kind of standard for the United States. And that one, they both cannot coexist with each other, that you cannot have a world of equals. The world is made up of inequals, and we must treat it that way. So forget the idea of developing Africa. It's just that th that's the way it is. So we got to just make sure that that's, it doesn't get any worse or any better so we can control it. So that's screwed up because that's not the way the universe works. Now, you had, now today you've had, you have Tony Blair pretty much not just as an advisor to Obama, but this guy's role is totally up in the air. Like, who is he right now? He is a UN peace envoy, but that's pretty much, that's the UN, the, the, the UN envoy of peace to the Middle East, but the Middle East is not any peaceful because of him. And you're having, Tony Blair was appointed recently the South Sudan government advisor. Like after the British made sure that the Sudan is broken up, you have, Tony Blair has uh, many agencies, like many international agencies. One of them is the, this, uh -oh. one of them is this Africa Go Governance Initiative, AGI, which has five departments, which has five offices in all parts of, uh, in, in different countries of Africa, controlling the presidency, like, like his departments, like C uh, Sierra Leone, Rwanda, Liberia, uh, and, where AGI has offices in the presidential department. So you are, you're guiding the presidencies, you're guiding the nations towards probable destruction. So this is, this is who we have right now as the British spokesperson. And, and if you look at Obama's policy, if you look at Obama's policies, like war policy, like Susan Rice, the UN ambassador uh, to, from United States, if you look at Samantha Powers, who is the head of the Obama's atro Atrocities Prevention Board, which makes sure that you have, that the United States can go into protecting other nations who are, who are torn up by tyrants. Uh, and you have another, another jerk who now left, but Cass Sunstein, who was a Harvard professor, pretty much writing documents as a professor talking about the fact that anybody who believes 9-11 was an inside job should be brainwashed, should be taxed, should be brainwashed, all conspiracy theories should be banned. But all, all these ideologies, and if you look especially at the, at the healthcare ideology of people like Sir Donald Berwick, of people who head up the National Health Services in Britain, very famous for euthan euthanasia and the lowest mortality, the highest mortality rates of cancer patients in Europe, that is in Britain, these people were imported under Obama to shape Obamacare, to shape the death panels, to shape, to shape euthanasia policies. And then, and then you have all these, all, so everything that Obama's doing, like in terms of economic policies, war policies, healthcare policies, and internal development policies, is in perfect concurrence with Britain, is in perfect concurrence with what Tony Blair and what the British have expounded for, for decades and centuries. So, that, so that, is why, that is why LaRouche stresses that Obama is a British puppet. It is very important to understand that. It does not mean that Obama and the Queen have morning and evening briefings with each other, but it does mean that Obama 
is on the same wavelength and is surrounded by people who are trained British agents. That the, and that this, this right now is a big problem for the world to understand right now. Now, what we are going to get at, I'm going to skip that. OK, pretty much nearing to the end right now is you're having a very small faction in the, in the United States and internationally organizing to stop this, organizing around like what LaRouche recently called for principle over party, pretty much declaring that the party system is over. It's not working. It, 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 it is done. People are fed up. It's lost its motive, its purpose, and therefore it must be done with, that people must break out of these cults called red versus blue and understand there's a higher principle involved. So that's what LaRouche wrote in 2011, November 1st. Uh, if some, Bob, can you read that? Or it's too small? Who can see that and who can read that? You can read that. Our planet is presently divided for the prospective early next world war. That principally between the set based in the transatlantic northwesterly half of the planet, as represented by powers of Britain, France, and the United States on one side, versus on the other side, Russia, China, India, and the remaining Asian nations. The presently still surviving pivotal target against which the Western triad of, triad of concentrated attacking force is now focused immediately for the immediate direct action is the combination of the immediately targeted nations of Syria and Iran. In this, the reason is given for what had been the original recent British motive for the destruction of Turkey and for the combination of actions which included the war criminal form of mass murder which was executed for expediency sake against, against Muammar Gaddafi and his party, as done by a leading role by French and USA forces, Sarkozy and Rockwell. Right. So that's what the fight is right now, is in the United States, we do have our movement organizing daily meetings and briefings with the Congress, with state legislators, with city councilmen on this very issue, on the issue of principle over party, on the issue of sovereignty. Because this is very important, because when, when you're bombarded, when you go out through the media, newspapers, family, friends, uh, TV, about the crisis in Syria, oh, we must go there, we must go there, we must break down West, the, pr the principle of Westphalia. And it, these are the people who are saying that, who are expounding that, you've got no reason to trust them. They are Tony Blair, they are Barack Obama, their track record sucks. And they, and uh, you're pretty much gonna hand, like it, when people talk about Syria's chemical weapons, well, damn right a nation who's surrounded by Al-Qaeda and Muslim Brotherhood might as well have some, ha, ha, is, has a right to have weapons. But how can you ensure that those weapons won't fall into the hands of Al-Qaeda like they did in Libya? How can you ensure that the Westphalia, that the Treaty of Westphalia, that, that the sovereignty of that nation will be upheld if, you want, if, if the government has changed. The people right now, like Tony Blair and Obama, cannot do that. They cannot, in fact, they, they are on a crusade to destroy this treaty. They are on a crusade to destroy the Westphalia principle and sovereignty of mankind, pretty much. So you've got our movement internationally, especially in the United States, who's leading the fight right now with a, with a few people, people like People like pushing HCR 107, House Concurrent Resolution 107, which impeaches a president for unconstitutional war. In, for example, as in the case of Libya, which, is, which was put forward by Walter Jones, the guy on the top right, and is also being pushed by many important people in, in the US political layers. For example, Bruce Fein, who's a former associate deputy attorney to Reagan, attorney general to Reagan, uh, Tony Schaefer, who is an ex-CIA officer, and many other, peop many other important people in the political layers. And uh, also, also people in the military, for example, Martin De General Martin Dempsey. Not that he has come out supporting ITSEA 107, but he has made it very clear that any initiative to go towards unconstitutional war would be an attack, not just on Iran, but on an, an attack on US sovereignty. 
in the end, I mean, the, the problem comes that the population cannot break out of its cowardice, which is, which is not just... Which, which is not just a magical thing, which is not just the way people are, but it, it, is, it, it, is a, it is a very recent adaptation of our generations to this kind of a mindset of cowardice. Of, because you had, we, we have a generation, much the three generations that are today, after the post-World War II generations, pretty much have done nothing as a population, pretty much have done nothing for the future to uphold the idea of immortality. They have, they have stopped no major wars. They have, they have don't built no major dams or no major, no major projects for the future. In fact, they have launched, they have accepted environmentalism, they've accepted this depopulation agenda and, uh, and accepted it as a way of life. So they, they know that they, they know that when you confront them with these things that it cannot happen because they know that they, will, they, that they, cannot, they themselves cannot be trusted with it. Because they, you're, you're living in a culture where people are willing to sell their neighbor for about another minute, for, just for another minute, just for their sake of their current pleasures. So you need, you need a paradigm shift. You need a shift in the mindset of, a, of people, especially a few people, to lead the fight. That the issue, the issue is that to act on principle. The issue is to act on principle of immortality of mankind, to understand that we have something beautiful we can do. Otherwise, you know, any future civilization that looks back on us, it's going to think, think of us no better than dinosaurs if we, don't, if we don't act to stop this right now. And the way to stop it is by, is by getting people educated on this idea of sovereignty and immortality. And, and pretty much you've got a movement right now internationally that has done the job, that has led the fight along with LaRouche, especially the, the, uh, much of the younger generation, which is in the movement, is right now very committed to that fight. So pretty much with that, I would like to end the discussion and uh, hand the floor to Matthew for the next presentation. Paradigm, like there has to be shift in, not in terms of an opinion of a few people, but uh, a, a shift in terms of principle, a shift in terms of the way people can think and uh, their, their idea of humanity. That, has to, that is the most important shift. So I want to I wanna first get into a video because I was going to present this by myself, but since LPAC TV did such a good job yesterday on their website, I, I felt it best to, to let them uh, do the job. So I'm just going to, uh, we're going to just watch a 30 minute quick video which goes into Benghazi and then pursue the presentation. That, that is why, right now, it is so important for civilization to remove Obama. Because it's very important to understand that, you know, why, like, just to look at Al-Qaeda, like, this was created by the British, by the United States at that point as an operation, as one of its many kinds of operations to undermine nation states, to undermine the Middle East, the, the whole Asia and Africa region especially. Uh, so we're going to have uh, three presentations plus a video from our, uh, our team in the United States, La Rouge Pack, totaling about three hours. Then we're going to have Q&A for about an hour or so. I'm going to start with the Avni Tapper. All right, so bonjour, hello everyone. Uh, my presentation is going to go through the, a bit of the current British geopolitical uh, paradigm that we are in right now. And, uh, and uh, what I'm going to end at is uh, that if you want to get out of that, there has to be a shift in a, through fear and chaos. And that's what we have to understand, that the only way to break it is by, break, is, is by fighting for sovereignty of nations, is by fighting for sovereignty of mankind. And, and I'm going to go through, for people who, I'm going to go through a bit of a background that, yes, this, it is in fact really the British and the United States behind not just funding, not just you know, giving them money, but actually aligning them strategically 
And as we can see, I mean, for people who've se for people who have been around or uh, who've been on the website for at least two, years, but it now needs it no longer, really, because it owns the president of in uh, of, uh, of United States. It owns Barack Obama, with its immense uh, financial institutions and its immense military uh, military institutions, with drones, with thermonuclear warfare. Al Qaeda and Osama bin Laden was pretty much obsolete and could be could be undermined. And 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 now what's common between between these extremist networks and and, and the, its creators is is the ideology. Is the ideology to rule the world 